These are a few classes that you will need to start a home or a daycare center. Infants, babies, all right? Smallest of the three, all right? When it comes to infant CPR, all right, we're dealing with somebody who is less than a year in development, all right? Bottom line, they're super tiny, they're super delicate, all right? And so when we're dealing with an infant, when we're dealing with a baby, like we discussed, we don't have to have them on the ground. They still need to be on a firm, flat surface though, okay? For these guys, instead of one or two full hands, it's just gonna be two fingers on the chest. Doesn't really matter which two fingers we use, we do strongly recommend two of the three middle fingers. It could be these two, it could be these two. It doesn't really make a difference, but um, make sure you're not looking, all right? Um, but just kind of go with me on that. Uh, for these guys, uh, giving breaths is slightly different. Um, instead of pinching the nose on the infant, we are simply going to take one hand, place it on the forehead of the baby, physically tilt the head back, and then we will cover up both an infant's nose and mouth with our mouth, all right? We're gonna give the two breaths into both orifices, basically, all right? But once we have the chest rise two times, all right, we've given enough air, all right? That concludes one full cycle of adult, child, or infant CPR. Like we discussed at the very beginning, this maneuver. To a, it's called an external lung or an ambu bag. And what essentially happens is they squeeze it and air goes into the person. So we never have to worry about pinching the nose and stuff like that. If you guys have one of those, great. I'm assuming we don't, right? The second most common one is uh, one that covers up the nose and mouth of the person that has a one-way valve in it that allows you to blow into both areas, okay? Uh, it basically fits over all those areas. The most common one is gonna be this type right here. It's a mouth-to-mouth -mouth barrier device. There's two major components to it. There's this stem right here, and inside of that stem, once it's placed into a person's mouth, it has a one-way valve in it that allows us to direct air into a person without anything coming out, right? The second component is this little face shield right here. This face shield uh, is uh, watertight, obviously, and it keeps any fluid that comes out of a person's mouth from coming into contact with you. So theoretically, if you have this installed in a person's mouth and they did have fluid that came out, it, this, or this mask is draped around the chin, the cheeks, and the lower end of the forehead so that when the fluid comes out, it'll run down their cheek or chin on one side of the mask and you will still safely be on the other side of the mask, right? These masks right here are very... Two, three, four, five. After that fifth one, we would bring the baby up and we're looking inside of the infant's mouth. See if we can see the object that the baby was choking on, right? Right. If you guys cannot see anything, all right, the baby's still choking, we would simply repeat the maneuver, all right? Mm -hmm. If you can see the object though, you're gonna try to get the object out by doing what's called sweeping the mouth. This is where we take our finger, generally our pinky, our smallest one, Stick it into the mouth, try to make a hooking motion around the object, and pull the object out, right? If you guys can see it, you do reach it, and boom, that object comes out. This baby will give you instant signs that they're no longer choking because they will begin to scream, they will begin to cry, they will begin to cough. They're going to begin to make noise with their mouth, right? Yeah. Once that happens, that object's out, the baby's no longer choking, you are done with this maneuver, right? But like we just discussed, if the baby is still choking, we would simply repeat the maneuver. In this case, we would grip the jaw again. Right. Flip the baby face back down onto the initial leg. Mm -hmm. Make sure that he's straddling that arm. And remember, decline position. So put that foot as far forward as it can go. Open-handed with the heel of our hand. Let's give her five back blows. One, two, three, four, five. Cuff the back of the head. Flip the baby face up. Remove your hand from the jaw. Make him straddle that arm again. Two fingers. Let's give her five chest compressions. Go. Five. Bring him up, look inside of that mouth. If you can see that object, you would try to sweep it out. If you guys can't see the object, you would simply repeat. So do it one time without me. Go. Are we beating or just pressing? Because I had to help.
what what led to this, right? It's almost always a 911 call. If we do have a person who's experiencing a grand mal seizure and they have uh, basically uh, an action plan in, pl in place that says, hey, you don't need to call 911 uh, until it lasts longer than five minutes or something like that, absolutely follow it, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? I think because we don't want them to be shaking and like swing their arm into like a chair, a table, or something like that, right? Once we have them there, we're gonna get something soft. This could be a pillow, this could be a balled up jacket, whatever. And we're gonna place it directly underneath the back of the person's head, all right? And so once we have them on the ground, either they're on their back, we place something soft underneath the back of their head. And this is the key. Take one hand, put it underneath the shoulder. Take the other hand, place it underneath the hip of the person. Physically pick that person up to rotate them. Reposition your hands and push them to hold them on their side. Okay, we get them onto their side during a seizure because if they were to remain on their back, we can have excess fluid that could accumulate and rest in the back of the throat. This could be mucus, saliva, blood, vomit, whatever, mm -hmm. right? We don't want that stuff in the back of the throat because that stuff can lead to a choking hazard, okay? That's why we get them onto their side so that if they do have fluid in their mouth that's accumulating, it'll go into their cheek and hopefully run out of their mouth, right? Once it's come out of the mouth, all right, don't be alarmed by that, all right? Do not stick anything in the person's mouth, meaning don't put your finger in the mouth to try to sweep that stuff out. Don't put a spoon in the mouth, papers in the mouth, liquids in the mouth, nothing goes in the mouth, all right? We also want to make sure that we don't restrict this person's <coughs> movement, all right? We can hold on to the shoulder and hold on to the hip. We don't want to hold on to any other part of the body, though. So arms, legs, <coughs> head, anything, all right? Let them shake, let them do their thing. Once the seizure is done, it is very common that this person will become responsive again. They'll, they'll wake up, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in children's cases, but it's not outlandish for an adult to do this, they can become pretty emotional, right? Um, they start to cry, uh, they start to sob, or they start to freak out. It, it's, it's a very common thing. Your brain's not all there yet. You really don't know where you are, or what's going on, what happened, and so your child's scared, and that's completely normal. Empathize with that, and try to keep them calm, right? But as long as they're responsive, we're good, right? That, that's what we want to happen. If after the seizure, however, this child is unresponsive, is not breathing, right? That's not okay, right? If they're unconscious and they're not breathing, it is now time to begin CPR for that child, okay? It's extremely rare for that to happen for a child. Normally this... Uh, Reaction. essentially it's our immune system going kind of crazy here right this immune reaction or more likely overreaction can manifest with physical signs and symptoms that we can associate with a mild and also severe allergic reaction right in mild cases all right if you guys um, you know have lived in Georgia for a long time and you guys have pollen allergies you guys know what I'm talking about my granddaughter comes around you guys get a, you know, an itchier, scratchy throat. You guys get itchier, scratchy eyes. You get a permanent runny nose for like a month. Um, bottom line here is that these are common symptoms of a mild allergic reaction. Commonly, we use over-the-counter medications like Benadryl, topical hydrocortisone cream, or antihistamines to get rid of the signs, right? If we're allowed to use those here, great. If you guys need parent permission to use those things, obviously get that, right? If we don't have permission, we are not giving children medication that their parents haven't expressly permitted, right? And if you guys have a strict protocol that says we just don't give medication out, follow that, right? In severe cases though, a severe allergic reaction is nothing to play games with, right? These are normally resulting in an immediate 911 call and the use of an epinephrine device, right? Um, theoretically, if I was to experience a severe allergic reaction in front of you guys right now, you would commonly see, um, like let's say I'm allergic to bees, right? I get stung by a bee. If you guys see a rash forming around that bee sting, that's completely normal, that small rash. But if that rash starts to spread up my arm pretty rapidly or starts to appear in other parts of my body, or you see uh, hives or welts start to show up, these are examples of a severe allergic reaction. If you see the facial features of a person start to become inflamed or start to uh, swell up, like the tongue of the person, the lips underneath the eyes, or the whole face starts to swell to two or three times its normal size, like this child can't close their mouth anymore because their tongue is so enlarged, this is a severe allergic reaction, right? Probably the most important thing. If a child's airway, or just anybody's airway, starts to become uh, tighter or starts to close up, so you start to hear kind of a <gasps> gaspy, raspy sound when they're trying to inhale, these are common symptoms that your airway's closing up. All of these are symptoms of a severe allergic reaction known as anaphylaxis, which can lead to anaphylactic shock, right? 
If we see any of these symptoms, all right, we typically this is a 911 call immediately, and if we have access to an epinephrine device or an EpiPen, it's time to use that, right? Uh, I meant to ask at the beginning, um, do teachers have the EpiPen in the classrooms or are they up at the front? Up front. So basically, if we had a child who was here having an allergic reaction, we would call you or somebody and you'd come running? Absolutely. Perfect, right? Um, so the EpiPen, all right, is a pretty straightforward mechanism. When it comes to using it, um, the, there's really only three major components that you can see, right? The handle of the grip that you always hold like this, right? Never put your finger on the top. Definitely don't put your finger on the bottom, right? The top of the pen, this blue cap right here, is a safety pin, right? It keeps this mechanism from working. So if you need to use it, you need to take this out. If you don't need to use it, obviously leave it installed, right? Mm -hmm. This part right here, this orange tip, is a, a pressure-sensitive mechanism. It's a trigger, right? When enough pressure is placed on it and this pen is removed, it'll trigger about an inch-long needle to flow out of the end of this pen, which will automatically inject, once fully extended, a pre-dose medication of epinephrine to a person. Epinephrine is a form of adrenaline, and after injecting this into their bloodstream, anywhere from 20, 30, 20 to 30 seconds after you've injected it, uh, it should cause the person's airway to have no choice that was tightening up to expand to its maximum amount. Meaning this child will be able to breathe for the next 10 to 15 minutes, right? That is the extent of the usefulness of this pen, right? 10 to 15 minutes, right? That's why we're calling 911, because that's... Uh, the whole idea is that we can come into contact with certain substances or even do certain activities that can trigger inflammation inside of our airway and inside of our lungs, and also a mucus layer to form in those areas, right? Um, just like with allergies, people are allergic to certain things and not to others, and people who are asthmatic are certainly triggered by certain things and not to others, mm -hmm. right? That being said, <clears throat> we can have people that have won what amounts to basically like the worst lottery ever, and they are allergic to pretty much everything on the list, and they're asthmatically triggered by everything on the list. Mm -hmm. So if we can avoid the substances, that's our best option, right? But if we can't, all right, then we're gonna end up having an asthmatic reaction triggered, right? Common asthma triggers would include things like dust, uh, mold, pollen, cigarette smoke, wood smoke, strong odors from chemicals like cleaning products or fragrances from like colognes or perfumes and things like that. We could also have a person who um, in winter time goes from like hot to cool temperatures or vice versa that could be a potential trigger or even exercise to the, to the, to the peak, right? Uh, this could be a potential trigger. In other more serious cases, we can have a person who has an asthmatic reaction triggered by um, strong displays of emotion, like anxiety, crying, yelling, or even potentially laughing, right? Mm -hmm. If we can avoid it, great, but as you guys probably noticed, that's pretty much everything that we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, if an asthmatic reaction is triggered, typically we're gonna see somebody who's experiencing a stiff cough that won't go away simply by calming down or drinking water. Uh, maybe they have like an itchy or scratchy sensation inside of their throat. They start to experience maybe a little bit of tightening in their chest. Uh, commonly, they're going to have a glassy look to their eyes or maybe have the inability to sit up straight while breathing, meaning they have to bend over to take a full breath, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to like if you guys were running around and you guys get to that point of like exhaustion and you have to bend over to take a breath, that's kind of like what we're talking about. However, for an asthmatic, it could just be that they came into contact with somebody's perfume, right? Bottom line is if we see these symptoms show up, these are common symptoms of a mild asthmatic reaction. If you guys do have a rescue inhaler at this point that was provided by parents or a nebulizer treatment, we want to go ahead and use that. Um, the rescue inhaler, uh, specifically when it comes to children, if they have the plastic spacer, that tube that comes with it, we want to use that, okay? That tube increases the efficiency of this medication pretty dramatically. So if we have, if we have it, we want to use it. But obviously if we don't have it, like the parents didn't supply it, it's not like we can't use the inhaler, right? Uh, so we use the medication and commonly after using it as prescribed, we should see signs of relief, right? The wheeze, the cough, the shortness of breath go away. They can sit back up straight. Uh, tightness in the chest goes down or goes away, and that's great, right? It means the medication did exactly what it was supposed to, right? At this point, we, it's a good idea to drink some water for that child, uh, just to swish it around their mouth, because that medication is really good for the airway and for the lungs. It, it's not really good for our teeth. Sometimes it can cause tooth decay, so we want to avoid that, right? Uh, but that's it. That should be the end all of all this stuff. <music>